Hello friends, it's Jim O'Rear. Today we are in Daytona Beach, Florida. Now this is a city that the police here say is a home of undesirables. Everything from college kids who come to blow off steam to biker gangs. It's a place where prostitution runs rampant and the home and stomping grounds of tons and tons of serial killers. Yes, like Oba Chandler and Robert Hayes and George Stanos, but today, we are going to focus on America's first female serial killer, Eileen Warnaus. We are gonna go see where she lived, where she hung out, even where she took her last drink when the police arrested her. So come along with us as we walk in the footsteps of Eileen Warnaus. Eileen Carol Warnaus was born February 29th, 1956 to teenage parents. She never met her father. He was incarcerated for sex crimes against children and later hung himself while in prison. While Aileen was four years old, her mother abandoned her and her six-year-old brother at their grandparents' house. Aileen never saw her mother again. Her grandfather was physically, verbally, and sexually abusive. Her grandmother was an alcoholic and did nothing to stop the abuse. By the age 11, she became sexually active both with her older brother and with boys at school and around the neighborhood in exchange for money, food, drugs, and cigarettes. At 14, her grandfather allowed a friend of his to sexually assault Eileen and she became pregnant. The baby was given up for adoption and Eileen was kicked out of her grandparents' home and forced to sleep in the nearby woods. By the age of 15, Eileen, homeless and desperate, was regularly engaging in prostitution to get by. Unsurprisingly, Warnow soon began engaging in other forms of criminality. At 18, she was arrested for DUI, disorderly conduct, and discharging a firearm from a moving vehicle. Failure to appear was added to her rap sheet when she skipped town for Florida. There she met and briefly married a 69-year-old wealthy yacht club president. Nine weeks later, he had the marriage annulled and filed a restraining order against her after she attacked him with his own cane while demanding money. In 1986, Warnows, now 30 years old, met Tyria Moore, a 24-year-old hotel maid. The couple met at a gay bar called the Zodiac Lounge, which has long been closed, but used to be in this building right here behind me. The couple entered a relationship and began living together. Moore quit her job at the hotel and allowed Warnows to support them via her prostitution. By late 1989, heavy alcohol use had caused Eileen to gain a great deal of weight, resulting in fewer interactions with her male customers. Eileen and Moore, strapped for cash, were often forced to sleep outside or in barns. Eileen devised a plan to solve their money problems. She would pose as a hitchhiker. Once an unsuspecting man picked her up, she would reveal that she was a prostitute in need of money and talk the men into driving to a remote location. There she would use a 22 caliber handgun to murder her victims, steal their cash and valuables, dump the body, and lastly, steal the victim's vehicle. Behind me is the Scoot Inn, which is where Eileen lived for several months during her big crime spree. Eileen and Tyria were living in the third room from the left of the old Fairview Inn, residing in room nine, or room eight, reports to differ on what number was on the door, as in 2015 it was renumbered as room seven. The Fairview Inn stayed pretty much the same. It was not very nice until 2011, when retired biker Mike Bach bought the motel, cleaned it up, renamed it the Scoot Inn, and did his best to distance it from its unsavory past. Ironically, he made it a much more inviting place to stay for people wanting to sleep in the same room as a famous serial killer. If her room is booked, though, you may want to try room four, which in 2007 was a hideout for two men suspected of dismembering a woman and scattering her body parts throughout Florida. Eileen's first victim was 51-year-old electronic store owner Richard Mallory, whom she killed on November 30th, 1989. Eileen would later claim that she had acted in self-defense after the man became violent. His body was found on December 13, 1989 by a pair of men in a Daytona Beach junkyard. He had been shot three times in the chest and his body wrapped in a carpet. His abandoned vehicle was found two days later. 
Richard Mallory's abandoned vehicle was found here, which contained his wallet, some condoms, and an empty vodka bottle. Somewhere between May 5th and May 19th, 1990, Eileen killed a second man, David Spears, a 47-year-old construction worker and heavy equipment operator. His body was discovered on June 1st, shot six times with a 22 caliber pistol in a wooded area off Highway 19 in Citrus County. A short time later, his abandoned truck was found, the license plate missing. In the meantime, Eileen killed again. Charles Karsakadon, a 40-year-old rodeo worker, shot nine times on May 31, 1990. His body was discovered a week later wrapped in a blanket. Witnesses reported two women driving a car that matched the description of the one belonging to the deceased man. Eileen was also seen pawning his gun. On July 4, 1990, emergency services received a call about a car crash in a neighborhood near Orange Springs, Florida. Two women exited the vehicle and told a witness not to call the police. Deputies arrived and discovered blood inside the car and the license plate missing. Bloody prints from the women were collected from the interior of the car. A VIN record search matched the car to 65-year-old Peter Sims, who had been reported missing on June 22nd. This would be Eileen's only victim whose body was never recovered. Either July 30th or 31st, 1990, Eileen killed again. A 50-year-old salesman, Tony Burress. His employer discovered that one of their drivers had not completed his final deliveries. They searched for him until 2 a.m. and finally reported him missing. The salesman truck was located two hours later by Marion County deputies. Five days later and eight miles away, some picnickers discovered his body in Ocala National Forest. He had been shot twice with a 22 caliber handgun once in the chest and once in the back. Eileen's sixth victim was a 56-year-old retired Air Force Major, Charles Humphreys, former Alabama Chief of Police and Child Services Investigator. September 11, 1990 was his last day of work. He never arrived home. The following day, authorities discovered his body shot six times. On or about November 19, 1990, Eileen killed her last known victim, Walter Antonio, a 62-year-old trucker, security guard, and reserve police officer. His body was discovered in Dixie County on Florida's Gulf Coast. Five days later, his car was located on the opposite side of the state in Brevard County. Tips began to pour in. Several pawn shops turned up items stolen from the victims. Thumbprints left on the receipts pointed to several women. Susan Blauvec, Lee Blauvec, Cammie Marsh Green, and Lori Grody, who all turned out to be aliases for Eileen. Police were able to follow the trail of the aliases to various rental properties and hotels, giving investigators a map of Eileen's movements. The crime lab finally made the most important match. The bloody handprint left in victim number four's car belonged to Eileen. Here at the Last Resort Bar is where Eileen spent a lot of time. It is also ultimately where she took her last drink, as it is where undercover officers lured her out of the bar and eventually arrested her. We're going to spend a few moments here at the Last Resort Bar because it was a very important location for Eileen. She even slept here at times when she had nowhere else to go. Uh, and um, again, it, I mean, it was her last taste of freedom. It is an incredible little biker bar that you notice advertises that it's the home of ice cold beer and killer women. And where the movie Monster was filmed. Yes, the Academy Award winning film Monster. Uh, featured this location and uh, other things have been filmed here as well but it is full of eye candy i mean just look you could spend hours just reading the bricks on the building all kinds of names dates statements uh, just really really interesting really interesting to walk around and just read all the bricks and um yes there is of course Eileen's name right there. It says, I was raped. Um, very, very cool. Now, we're going to head on in here. And uh, if you go right here in this side door, you'll notice lots and lots of more bricks to read. But right over here immediately, now we're going to go inside the main building in just a moment. I want to show you this first, though. This is like a shrine to Eileen. And it's uh it's pretty cool it's got uh you know a little painting of her and her name uh 
as well as over here all the other aliases that she was known by, uh, what she had for her last meal, when she died, how she died, her final words, little items that people have left for her on the shrine, and then over here on the left, a list of her victims. So pretty neat little little shrine there. And uh, hey, oddball thing, Eileen peed here. Yeah. Okay, anyway. <laughs> There's the restrooms. And um, we're going to head out here into the yard, and you can sort of see the, the grounds a little bit with all the coffins and tombstones and monsters. Um, it just, I mean, it just tons and tons of stuff uh, to, to look at. There's even a, there's a second bar out here, out back, right there, um, that I'll give you a look at. But, uh, but you know, like I said, Eileen spent her last day of freedom here. It took her last drink here. Um, you know, all the evidence was pointing against her. And uh, undercover officers were put in the bar because they knew that's where she hung out. And uh, one of them offered to let her shower at his hotel. And as they came out of the bar, she was promptly arrested. And, um, you know, they didn't have a murder weapon or anything yet, so they just booked her on an outstanding warrant. And then the rest of the evidence fell into play after that to, uh, to really um, make her guilty. But uh, this was it. This was, this was the location that it, that it all went down. And you can see some of this in the movie Monster. It doesn't show you how big the grounds are, but it does definitely show you in here. This is the main part of the bar. And, I mean, stuff on the ceilings, on the walls, on the bar, on the floor... It is just, I mean, eye candy galore. Uh, it, it's really, really quite overwhelming, even. There's so much to read and look at. Lots of photos from past events and bike weeks and customers and, uh, again, more monsters and clothing. And everywhere you look, there's writing and signatures. And it, it's just, the the walls speak history major history of this location and uh here's even a uh i guess a collection of bras <laughs> what the heck right uh they've also got some uh some of the newspaper articles about eileen and uh and the bar itself there's charlize theron who won the academy award for playing the character in monster and of course they have the monster poster that's hanging up there but uh incredible bar and uh i hope uh i hope you like looking at it a, a little bit closer uh right here amazing the following day moore was located at her sister's house in pennsylvania and offered immunity if she could get eileen to confess through a series of recorded phone calls moore was able to coax eileen into confessing to keep moore her longtime lover safe from prosecution lee they're, they're coming after me i know they are what? I'm not going to go to jail or anything. Listen, I have to confess myself. Mm. Okay. Yes. Why the hell did you do this? Uh-huh. Why did you do this? I don't know. Listen, Ty. Wait. I'll probably never be able to see you. Yes. I love you. Eileen made a number of conflicting statements during the course of the calls. She claimed her victims had sexually assaulted her, and she shot them in self-defense. She later said that she robbed the men and then killed them so there would be no witnesses. And finally, she claimed to have killed because she was angry that the men did not want to have sex with her. Well, I came here to confess. I wanted to be straight up with one thing right there and now. Sure. The reason I'm confessing is there's not another girl. I There's no other girl. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 okay, so then what you're telling us is you're voluntarily coming forward to talk to us now. Yeah, to let you know that I'm the one that did the charge. 
I was very, I never provoked those guys. I never provoked them. I never showed any provocations whatsoever. It was very nice, very decent, very clean, very ladylike. I didn't even swear in front of my clients. And a lot of my clients, I talked about Jesus and I talked political, both mixed together and we never argued. <laughs> Moore also towed the police where Eileen had ditched her gun, and it was recovered, a 22 caliber revolver that matched each of the murders. With a confession and a murder weapon, along with a fingerprint evidence, this was more than enough to take Eileen to trial. On January 14, 1992, Eileen was sentenced to death for the murder of her first victim. Over the next year, Eileen pled guilty or no contest to five more murders. Since the body of her fourth victim had never been found, she was not charged with this murder. In total, Eileen received six death sentences, and on October 9th, at the age of 46, she was executed by lethal injection. So, I hope that gives you a little peek inside Eileen Warnow's, as well as a look at what some of the places she hung out at uh, look like now. And um, we're going to be looking at some more serial killers. So, I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. If you have, click that like button to let the powers that be know that you like the video. And while you're at it, click on follow or subscribe, and you'll be notified when I upload new videos. But thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.